I know, I appreciate that you've had a little time in that very brief break in which you, you hopefully grab a coffee and a comfort break. Um, I would now like to commence session two of our very busy programme here at NASCAR's Right to Build Expo. Uh, and the next session is really why support custom and self What is the political motivation behind it? And who better to lead on this than Richard Bacon, the, the chair of the all party parliament to do self build, custom build, community house building and place making? I almost got it right. What <laughs> extra word in there? It's the longest APPT yes. in the rest of the entire parliament. That's and of course, right. the man behind the right to build, Richard. Over to you. Michael, thank you very much. Yes, it does have the longest name of any uh, all party parliamentary group. I like to say because that's, that's because it's the best all parliamentary uh, party group. Um, the word community actually was, I, I, I basically put in the hopper every thing I could think of. It's the all party parliamentary group on self build, custom and community house building and place making. Because making great places is what it's supposed to be all about. And that's so we have great communities. And it was the Labour MP for Nottingham, uh, Graham Allen, who's now no longer in Parliament, uh, he's sort of retired. But he came with Mario and Michael and me to Berlin some years ago, we were looking at property there. And he said to me when we were talking about the, uh, the, the group, he said, I get the word community in there if I were you. And I'm very glad I did. It was a very good uh, suggestion. So, what am I going to do here? Yes, well, we've got a thing called the White Paper. Housing White Paper came out in January, written by Gavin Barber, who was Housing Minister, now lost his seat, but is uh, now at the seat of power. He's the Chief of Staff to Theresa May, the Prime Minister, and he's still just as interested in this as he was when he was Housing Minister. And it's called Fixing Our Broken Housing Market. I think that's terrific because it's an acknowledgement we have a problem. And generally, you don't solve your problems uh, until you acknowledge that you have them. The fundamental question I've been wrestling with for some time, and Michael was alluding to this earlier, is why is it the supply of housing doesn't rise to meet demand? For most other things you think about, for example, you're all sitting on chairs, or most of you are. Um, uh, and and we have, we, I haven't actually crawled down looking, but I bet you're all wearing shoes. This seems to work. The, the supply of shoes rises to meet the demand for shoes. The right, this demand for chairs seems to rise to meet the demand. We don't think we need a national shoe service. No one says, you know, we need a help to sit campaign. <laughs> Funded by you as taxpayers so that we have uh, enough chairs. And yet, by some strange alchemy, we do have enough chairs and enough shoes. Now, there are lots of reasons that are given why this... Um, uh, uh, gosh, this is so... Uh, is that better? Um, the reasons we commonly given, we know them all, finance, land and planning. And it's this kind of the interaction of these three. Uh, and quite often you get financiers saying, well, you know, it's all down to the availability of land, or planners saying it's all down to the financiers, or people saying, well, of course it's all the planners' fault. The truth is, we have a shortage of financeable propositions. We have um, uh, only 1.2% of the land area of the UK given over to housing. If you doubled it, 97.6% of the land area of the UK would still be not housing. Uh, more land in Surrey is devoted to golf courses than is devoted uh, to housing. So there's not really a shortage of land. The, we keep on hearing about this wall of money, but there aren't enough good financeable uh, propositions. Uh, and we do have, it's widely acknowledged, and Housing and Planning Act, which I'll come on to in a moment, um, uh, there was a widespread acknowledgement that we have a skill shortage in planning. Part of the reason for that is because this thicket has become so complicated, many people who were in planning have left. You go into planning, I think, in order to help make great places. You end up being the man or the woman who says no, and lots of people don't really like that. So they've become kind of development controllers or development stoppers. And many of the people leave and go and work for <coughs> big consulting firms on, 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 on a healthy wedge, often increasing their salaries, in order to help people through the thicket that we've managed to navigate. The two red lines show the story. The one on the left, new home completions over about the last 60 years. The one on the right, prices. Um, the children in Taysborough Primary School in my constituency, if you say to them, they're nine years old, and if you say to them, what happens to the price of something if there isn't enough of it? They will all say, hey, it goes up. And something which one or two, I've met Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee economists who seem to want to deny this basic relationship. Here's Kevin, Kevin McLeod. This is what he said to our old party group three years ago. The consumer has been on the receiving end of a pretty poor deal. We've built some of the poorest, most expensive, and smallest homes in Europe. That's not something to celebrate. Brian, you're going to give me five, aren't you? Um, uh, the intellectual problem we have is the question of whether development's good or bad. I think it's good, but the word development is often used as a pejorative term. The word developer is now a swear word. Is that fine? Thank you. Um, we're doing a, and you're getting more for less this time. I'm going to just go faster. Um, we, 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 uh, I've been accused of being too fast already, but um, uh, we don't think about development versus undeveloped, which is the obvious answer. We forget that civilization is cognate with cities. 
Here are some words on my word life. Missed, smart, connected, and beautiful, which we'll go into the next iteration, by the way. But these are good words. But at the moment, we have a broken housing market where demand is unable to influence and drive volume in the way that it does in nearly every successful market you can think of, not just shoes and chairs, but pretty much everything you can think of. Um, the answer, if we want to make development a good word, then we have to have good development. But at the moment, most people, most people feel they have no real say over what gets built, where it gets built, how it performs, I mean in terms of thermal performance and other kinds of performance and space, what it looks like, or crucially, who has the first chance to live there, back to that word community. If you change all that, you change the conversation. But house builders, unsurprisingly, like other private sector providers, have no incentive to build more houses they, than they can sell. It's hardly surprising. And 67 to 7%, 67 to these are both YouGov numbers. The 75% number was commissioned by the NAXPA, but from YouGov, it's independent research. Uh, the 67% number from the Home Builders Federation, the trade body of the home builders themselves. Uh, found that 67% of people would prefer to or are unlikely to give um, uh, to, to buy their product. But should we blame the volume house builders uh, for that? Or should we be asking, is it that thicket, the thicket we created, I mean all these things, that has created a very big problem? So that whereas in 1988, 66% of houses were built by SMEs, now it's just a handful. We have created this thicket, and we've created the response to that thicket, and everyone is as much just simply acting rationally inside a very suboptimal system. Development should mean making great places to live that are well designed and well built, well connected, well served, well run, environmentally sensitive, so you're green as normal, with a thriving economy with lots of local jobs which are active, inclusive and safe. In other words, they're fair for everyone. In other words, we should separate the business of place making from the business of home making. And we're all in the slide making business, and you've seen this one before. But that's <laughs> how we should be doing. We should give maximum choice. Now you have the average in, in, the, in the developed world. You can see the UK is the outlier. The red line is the average of uh, self building, custom house building. We don't all have to be like Austria on 86%, but uh, we are way, way below the average. That's what we need. That's a service plot. If it was easy to get one of those, as it is to go into a Ford dealership and buy a motor car, we wouldn't have a housing problem. When you have 2,000, then they look like that. You've probably seen that slide as well. That's from our mayor from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. What we really need is consumer choice. The Dutch, uh, Michael talked about this, doubled the, the rate in the expert group, so I won't spend time on that. Here's our legislation. The self-built custom house building has individuals and associations of individuals. Associations of in individuals, very important. That could be anyone from uh, uh, the Royal British Legion helping veterans to the governors of a high school helping to uh, try to find mm -hmm. a way to recruit teachers in difficult to fill subjects mm -hmm. to the managers of a county council social services department looking for senior mm -hmm. managers with 20 years experience leading teams to just a group of friends but associations of individuals is going to be a very important component of this in the future it's been strengthened by the housing planning act which provides not only an obligation to keep a register but to provide sufficient planning permissions to meet the demand. You see that in section two at the top there in red. The real issue is choice. Why have I got, the, why have I got next up there? That's uh, the flagship store on the edge of my constituency. It costs nothing to heat. I was talking to the construction manager at the launch. And uh, the idea that if next went along to a contractor and said, please build for us uh, a, a new flagship store, and uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how much it costs to heat, the contractor would come back and just be able to do what he or she liked. It's nonsense. Of course, next would go elsewhere to get a contractor that provided what they wanted. Well, we don't have that choice at the moment in the house building market for residential, although we know how to build dwellings that cost nothing to heat for 30 years. Uh, by the way, this is a very important point about tenure. We heard about co-housing earlier. My colleague, Joe Cox, who was murdered, lived in a co-housing project. That boat she lived on in East End was a co-housing project. This is in Potsdam. It was built by seven single moms uh, uh, who are uh, then are renting it through a housing cooperative, what they call a genossenschaft, at an affordable rent. Uh, this is a, a dwelling in Berlin with several hundred people, several hundred flats where they went to the local authority. The social group that holds those parents together is they've got kids with special needs and they said we want flats with a school and a garden and a school in the middle. Um, this is in the Netherlands, they're all completely different from one another, they're all self-built. Look at the uh, roof there, you see that? It's all, the entire thing's photovoltaic cells. This is the big yard in Berlin. To Michael's point about everyone liking their little fences, these are all individual properties, but they share one garden at the back. Guess what? The kids will play together and they all go in and out, in and out of each other's houses and they end up feeding each other. And there's the big yard again. Um, so more choice, this is in the Netherlands, I'm finishing with this now, Bryony. Um, these are just different ideas of what people want. And the point is, these are driven, many of them are terraced houses, 
They will not be everyone's taste. They're not everyone's cup of tea, and they're very different from one another. So some are traditional, some are much more modern, some are coloured, um, some are steel, some are concrete, some are red, some are yellow. This one looks like a pyramid, this one's blue. Uh, this one wants everyone to know he lives at number seven. <laughs> and this one wants you to know he lives at 14, he's not quite as keen. Um, this one has no windows. Uh, it, was, it was done by a film director uh, who wanted a house with no windows. I've been inside, it's plenty of light in there. This is not upside down boat. If you want something more traditional, he likes a walking window. Um, this is slightly more uh, conventional, but still quite modern. If you want something more traditional, well, there's plenty of that too. There's, a, there's even thatched, and these ones here are opposite that one there. There's a huge choice. We have government support. Sajid's office, Sajid Javid's office contacted me last week, said he wants me to go and see him next week. I'm seeing him next Thursday, and I'm taking Mario and Michael with me. Mark my words, the, uh, to, to Lawrence's point about riding the, ter riding the surf, there is going to be more of this. If you read paragraph 3.17 of the white paper, it says, if there isn't enough, we will legislate again. So the question is, is how we take advantage of this opportunity. We are talking about possibilities of, if you're going to have help to buy, which is obviously intellectual garbage, but if you're going to have it, you should have <laughs> help to build. You should have an even uh, playing field. We're having a round table soon. Oh, look, I've done it, Brian. Thank you very much. <laughs>